Well, welcome everyone. I'm Larry Schaefer, owner and winemaker at Terracera Wines, and I'll be moderating tonight's Santa Barbara County Roan Ranger uh, tasting featuring Grenache. I am joined by some wonderful, wonderful people here. Uh, Adrian Rohl with Rideau Vineyards, Megan Bravo with Folded Hills, and our birthday boy, Matt Brady with Sam Sarah. And I'll continue to say birthday boy again and again and again because you know you have to do that. So all right. <laughs> very, Thanks, very Larry. Excited. You know, we we are all uh Grenache is one of these varieties that I think we all kind of grow to love passionately because it it shows itself so well aromatically, textually. It's just a very pretty variety, but it also has so many different aspects and flavors to it. So it's gonna be fun to to go through these with very, four very different Grenaches from very different parts of the county. So a little background about Grenache, um, it's really seen quite a growth. And all I can talk about is District 8, which includes Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, and Slow County, because that's what the Grape Crest Report gives me. Uh, but from 2010 to 2020, we saw a doubling in the amount of tons that were produced. Um, that's compared to Morvedra, which had a 10% increase with the amount of tons that were produced. So there's a lot of people working with Grenache, both as a standalone um, and as a blending variety. Grenache is grown in pretty much every corner of Santa Barbara County. It is grown in Happy Canyon in the warmest parts of the county. It is grown in the Santa Rita Hills, some of the coolest parts of the county. It is grown up in Santa Maria. It's grown in Ballard Canyon. It's grown in Los Olivos District. It's grown in the Santa Inez Valley. It's even grown south of Buellton in places like Folded Hills. So it's grown everywhere in the county because it does well everywhere. It's a chameleon of a grape. It tends to enjoy heat, especially heat, but we are finding that we can kind of push the envelope and plant it in cooler areas with viticultural tricks to actually get it ripe and produce some interesting wines. So Grenache has been in California for a very long time. It really was known as a blending variety. It was heavily cropped in the Central Valley and other parts of California where it really would go into jug wines more than anything else. It would crop at eight, 10, 12 tons an acre in the Central Valley. If you ever had a Gallo Hardy Burgundy, you had Grenache because it made up a huge amount of those wines. Um, things kind of changed when Tablas Creek established their nursery. They brought cuttings over from Chateau Bocastel and they had three different clones that they brought over. And those clones all produced darker, more concentrated Grenaches. And that was kind of the start of an era of a lot more single variety Grenaches coming onto the marketplace in addition to blends. Um, and after that, we had other people like Antov and John Alban uh, creating clones that also produce smaller clusters, uh, more concentrated berries. And again, that kind of changed the game um, starting in the late 90s. Uh, it's always been very popular in Chateauneuf du Pop. When Chateauneuf du Pop replanted after Phylloxera, Grenache was the variety that took best to grafting. And so 70% of Chateauneuf du Pop is planted to Grenache, a lot less to other things. Um, and Grenache also has its naturally occurring genetic mutations. Many of you are familiar with Grenache Blanc, which is popular here in Santa Barbara County. There is also some Grenache Gris. These are all genetically modified variations of the original Grenache grape. So before I talk any further, I'm gonna go ahead and let other people talk because I tend to talk a lot. So Adrian, I'm gonna let you introduce your wine and I'll ask some questions about the wine as we get going here. All right, so this is our 2017 Estate Grenache uh, and talking about clones and tablas, this is actually the tablas one clone. And it is a little bit on the lighter side. Part of that has to do with vintage and part of that has to do with our soils and um, water uptake <laughs> and uh, the amount of sun as well. But one of the things I love about this wine is even though it is so light in color, it does not skimp on the flavors or the aromatics. And I think that's one of my favorite things about Grenache as a whole is, you know, it's it tends to be a lighter in color wine than people expect when they hear Rhone, but yet just because it's light in color, it can deceive your other senses because it is, in fact, very flavorful, very aromatic, and yeah, I, I love Grenache. <laughs> so uh, we're in the Los Olivos district, which is kind of in the center of the San Inez Valley between Ballard Canyon and Happy Canyon. And this is a 25% whole cluster, 25% new, actually this year, I'm looking at my notes, it was only 17% new French oak. 
So minimal new oak, just to enhance a little bit of the depth in the tannin structure, but the whole cluster, this was one of the first years we finally started putting a little bit of whole cluster in the estate Grenache. And we really loved what it did for, again, that textural component with the tannins. Gave, brought some of that spice forth, but also I think it really kind of stabilized the fruit structure. So this is that, but it was 22 months in barrel before going to tank and then bottle. So, there you uh, go. Question for you, did you bleed yes. it at all to try to concentrate color? We do, we pull about an 8% Seigne and 17. Maybe you can explain what that means. Yes, so Larry called it a bleeding and Seigne is derived from you know, the same root for sangre or any other multiple languages for blood. And it's pulling off some of that juice. So when we process this, you know, the grapes have quite a bit of weight and they will juice, the top grapes will press down and they'll juice the lower grapes. And then we actually get in there with a pump and we pull juice out. And the reason we do that is so that you have a lower juice to skin ratio. All of your color and all of your flavors, not all, most of your color and most of your flavors are found in the skins of red grapes, especially, but also in white grapes. And by pulling out some of the juice, you make that ratio much higher in the skins, which is therefore concentrating your flavors and your colors. So yes, we did pull one and this year was, you know, it, it very looked very Grenache gris on the vine. <laughs> so at some point it's not gonna get any more color, but we were very happy with it because again, it is light and it doesn't look like it's gonna have much flavor, but it was really a pleasant surprise when we, when we got the finished wine. And did, and I know Grenache has a tendency if it gets direct heat to actually bleach the skins. Did you see any of that with the heat in 2017? Uh, so this was pulled shortly after with enough time to recover from the heat. But we didn't necessarily see any bleaching, but we realized that if we, if 2017 had been like 2020, where there was multiple heat spikes, we definitely would have seen some bleaching. So we pulled it in because there was another bit of heat coming. And so the, it actually came in at um, 23, uh, 23 bricks, which was lower than we normally would bring it in. But with the heat coming and the way the fruit looked and the concern over the bleaching and the flavors were, quite tasty when it came in as juice, we decided to go ahead and pick it, or I decided to go ahead and pick it. And, by, and for those of you, by bleaching, so most grape varieties, if they have direct sunlight hit them, the grapes harden. With Grenache and a couple of other varieties, the skins actually lose their color. So you'll be walking down a vine and it'll look like a pink grape. It's a lesson learned. And I remember I was working with a vineyard, a Watch Hill vineyard, which a couple of you have worked with, um, in a very cold year and the vineyard manager had suggested other winemakers were pulling all the leaves from the fruiting zone. He goes, I, I probably wouldn't do that. I'm like, well, I'm not a viticulturalist. I'm going to go with you. I'm a winemaker. Um, sure enough, we had a heat spike and the next week you walk down the rows that the leaves have been pulled and one half of the cluster looked pink. Um, yeah, we definitely have had some vines that that happened where, you know, there's, there was a little bit too aggressive leafing and so we've definitely seen that happen, but we try very, we, I work with um, Coastal and Ruben manages our vineyard and he and I walk the vineyard on a regular basis just to make sure that we're talking every time there's some not perfect weather situation on the horizon, whether it's, you know, 2020 and we're talking about whether or not to water and what the plan is for picking or if it's, you know, we need to pull leaves because it's cold and you know more of a 2011 situation 2011 i think it was 2011 <laughs> you got a situation like that you know we look at the we both look at the weather forecast and then we come together and we talk about it and get on the same page and then you know again like you larry i am not a viticulturist and so <laughs> i ask his opinion a lot on here's what i want the grapes to look like when they get to the winery <laughs> what do we need to do in the vineyard to make that happen Fantastic. Adrian, uh, how old are the vines, can I ask? Yeah, uh, these were planted in the mid-90s. So they were planted uh, 96 to 98 was when the original planting on the estate, which is just under 13 acres. And that, like I said, is they're all topless clones. For the Grenache, it's topless one. 
And then in 2017, March of 2017, we planted a 1.11 acre parcel on the property and we planted it in two and a half by three spacing and TP trellises. So the A-frames that you see, and that's actually split to uh, almost equally Grenache, Syrah, and Maved. And in that section, our Grenache is Grenache 362. So cool. So very different. And the trellising style completely changes the style of the wine as well. So for perspective, two and a half by three, for those of you watching, is about half of the spacing. As, so it's much more concentrated than the rest of our property, which is planted at five by eight, which is five feet between rows and eight, or sorry, five feet between vines and eight feet between rows. So this is two and a half feet between vines and three feet between rows. Probably like 5,000 vines per acre or something like that. Yeah, I could get the actual count. I'd have to look it up. But yeah, it's very tight spacing and it's our little roan jungle because the canopy is <laughs> insane. The shoots go crazy. They all get entangled. And you know it's constant canopy management, but not you don't want to go too crazy with hedging or anything like that. So anytime we walk through, we always joke around that you kind of need a machete. And I'm nice and short, so at just over five feet tall, walking through those vines, my cellar master keeps threatening to put a little like locator flag on my head so that he can <laughs> find me when I'm sampling because <laughs> he has no idea where I am. Love it. Owning <laughs> Yeah, some sort of little beacon or something. <laughs> Because he can't find me to save his life, <laughs> which is, you know, fine if you want some time alone. A little problematic if he's trying to ask a question. <laughs> that, does that make harvest pretty difficult that way? or um, The first year that we brought, so we just planted it in 2017, so it hasn't produced a whole lot yet. We actually did bring in one quarter of a ton of Grenache in 2018. <laughs> we bottled, uh, we, it was actually kind of fun, we bottled it this past year in July, August of 2020, we bottled 30 Magnums. Oh, wow. It was pretty crazy. Well, I guess <laughs> uh, it was, or sorry, 30 cases of Magnums. We bottled 30 cases and I believe we still have some for sale, <laughs> but it was a kind of a fun one-off. We're like, it's 30 cases of something. And we were like, let's do Magnums because why not? And so it's um, one of our reserve wines. We put a reserve style label on it, but even its own version of that. And comparatively, it's much different. That tight spacing concentrates the fruit in an additional level than Signet does because the vines have to compete for everything. So instead of, you know, on our main block, you know, Grenache clusters are pretty decent size. And then on these, they're much smaller. We do have some very large clusters that come through, but the berries are also a lot smaller because they're just, they're struggling more. They're fighting for every bit of nutrient, every bit of water. They're struggling for absolutely everything, but they're also, the fruiting zone is only 18 inches off the ground instead of 36. I believe our other fruiting zones are about 36 inches. So at 18 inches off the ground, they get the warmth from the ground. So they're not at, at, as at risk of frost or cooling down. So they continue to ripen and benefit from that kind of greenhouse effect throughout the night and through the entire ripening season. Very cool. Well, a, a question came in from Denise and I'll let other uh, people men, uh, answer if they want to probably I'm going to let Matt probably answer this because he works uh, a lot with cooler climate stuff. Uh, Denise was asking about a Grenache from John Sebastiano vineyard that she's having and it's very uh, dark and rich and she's asking if that's typical of cool climate Grenache. I think that it is. Uh, I mean that's I think that's kind of a good you know general thing across a lot of varietals but something we see with Grenache for sure where the cooler climates you know, typically produce thicker skins. So you get a little bit more skin color. Um, and yeah, we have some Santa Rita Hills Grenache sites that we've worked with at Samsara in the past that are that are super dark. Um, I was actually supposed to go look at JSV Grenache today, but um, it was a little too wet out in the vineyard to get out there. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think in general, you know, one of the great things about Grenache and one of the great things about Santa Barbara is we have this 
kind of breadth of style and Grenache can sort of fit into any corner of the county as Larry was saying. Um, but out of the cooler sites in Santa Rita and, and you know, even, even Ballard Canyon, you know, it's pretty cold at night there. Um, you, you can get some really nice color provided that you've got the canopy to protect against that sun damage that we were just talking about because Grenache is susceptible um, to sun damage. So that, that is, I think, the one watch out with Grenache is it, it's a little tricky in the vineyard because you want to protect it from the sun and have enough canopy to protect it, but you also want to, to facilitate airflow and Grenache, because it can crop pretty heavy, a lot of times it gets all gunked up in there. And, and uh, you know, one of the, the strategies we have in the vineyard is to, to actually leaf out kind of the interior part of the canopy and do tunneling and help facilitate airflow that way. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, kind of a delicate balance with Grenache, trying to, trying to protect it, but also trying to, you know, leave it open enough to where it's going to, um, you know, not produce any compromised fruit. I think one of the challenges with cool climate is just getting it ripe enough. I think Grenache is one of those varieties that if it doesn't get ripe enough, it doesn't express kind of the beauty that the variety brings to the table. To me, it's, it's kind of like Zinfandel in that way. If, if I, when I have an underripe Zinfandel, it's um, not very pleasant. If it doesn't have that raisiny pruny quality, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't have the typicity of the variety. Grenache certainly has a lot of different typicities, but if it just doesn't get ripe, it just, to me, it just seems to miss something along the way, aromatically, especially. So, well, let's go ahead and go into the second wine. So Megan, you are up. All right, yay, great. Um, well, I'm with Folded Hills Winery. We're a little bit newer winery than um, any of my colleagues here. Uh, and we're in a very unique location, really. So we're sort of the furthest southern um, vineyard in Santa Barbara County. So we're actually in the San Ynez Valley AVA, technically. Um, but if you look on the AVA map, we're really sort of out there. We're kind of by right off the 101 highway by um, Nahui Falls, if you know where that is. And it's about four miles south of the town of Buellton. And I'm not sure how many people are local on here or have visited. I hope you've all visited the area. If you haven't, you're really missing out. But, um, and uh, we actually, I would call us a little bit of a Grenache house. We started off um, planting, we have, we planted in 2015. So again, we're a pretty young vineyard. I'm, I'm probably working at the youngest vineyard on this call. Uh, but we're really, really happy with the site. The site itself um, is owned, it's a 600 acre ranch and uh, we're owned by Kim and Andy Bush. And Andy is a direct descendant of the Anheuser-Busch family, actually. Um, so he has purchased two ranches that are now put together. And on the uh, property that where the tasting room is, uh, that was homesteaded in 1898. And we found out, we found an old photograph when they purchased the property in 2011, um, only the second owners of that property, that there were, uh, they say pre-prohibition grapes on the land, but it was 1932 and that was still prohibition. So <laughs> you were allowed to make wine. It's okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say it was for the local mission or whatever. Um, we're not sure what was planted there, but, and their vine, those vines are unfortunately long gone, but we can maybe assume that it was some California Italian varietal because it was a sort of Swiss Italian family, um, pioneers of California wine industry, as we know, that had planted there. So now the vineyard sits on sort of a hillside, a, a little bit different hillside, the red uh, vineyard. And there's, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, 15 acres total planted. We only grow Rhone varietals. So uh, in our white program, it's Grenache Blanc, Claret Blanc, and Marsan. And then our red program is only Grenache and Syrah. And Grenache is actually like 50% of the entire vineyard. It's, it's over seven acres. So there's three large blocks of Grenache on the hillside. And you can see the vineyard, it's hard to see from the road, like down by the property, but if you're coming down the 101, 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to see the vineyard. <laughs> so if you're coming down the 101 highway from Santa Barbara, if you're headed towards Buellton, you're heading uh, north bound on the 101 and you pass the Gaviota Tunnel, I think you know where I'm talking about, <laughs> three miles about past the Gaviota Tunnel, you go up a big grade and then you go down the hill. And as you're coming down the hill, you can see Folded Hills Vineyard and our Grenache vines on the right-hand side. Um, so yeah, younger vineyard, but we're really, really happy with the results. Uh, here tonight, we're drinking our 2018 Grant Grenache, which is really one of our flagship wines. Uh, this label, this is sort of our logo here. It's part of our heritage wines collection. Uh, we do make several Grenaches, <laughs> of Grenache. So, uh, there's some reserve wines in there. We make some, you know, estate wines, but those are really smaller production. I really wanted to show sort of uh, what Folded Hills is really known for, which is our Grant Grenache. We also make our August Red as a Syrah Grenache blend. So uh, 2018, pretty big vintage. I also noticed that a lot of these others um, are 2018 as well. And I would say Folded Hills um, in general is a little bit cooler climate vineyard. It was funny that Larry said Grenache likes heat because I was like, gosh, our, our vineyard is just, I think a little bit cooler climate, but we're not cool enough to grow Pinot Noir. It's interesting. We're actually the closest vineyard to the ocean in Santa Barbara County. We're only 4.5 miles from the ocean, which is actually closer than any vineyard in Santa Rita Hills that's growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, but the way that the mountains are formed and the valley is formed, that we're sort of on the back side of Gaviota Peak. Remember I said you come up and over that hill. So that mountain range actually kind of blocks us from, from the marine layer. So the marine layer really burns off quite quickly in the day. Um, I would say during the, you know, the uh, growing days that and ripening days that it's really, um, it is, it is a warmer site than in Santa Rita Hills. That, that fog is not there to protect the grapes. And, and actually, it's a really, um, if any of you are familiar with the Gaviota area, which is technically our address, is Gaviota. It's very, very windy in Gaviota, <laughs> um, which is actually really advantageous for us because all that airflow, like Matt was saying, is really, really good for the grapes. It's not going to, um, it's gonna really prevent uh, rot and mildew and anything like that. So even if we did have fog, you know, in a morning, it's so windy there <laughs> that uh, we're not really worried about uh, mildew, which is great. And so this is actually, uh, there's a tiny touch of Syrah in it. There's, <laughs> I'll be honest, not 100%, there's about 6% Syrah in there. And um, you can see it's pretty light colored too. Um, it's a little, a little bit uh, really ruby color. And this one is all the Elevage on this one. Thanks, Larry, yeah, awesome. This one is 11 months in neutral French oak barrels. It's 100% de-stemmed fruit, actually. We make several Grenaches that do have whole cluster. But this particular one, we're doing uh, de-stem just to have a different flavor profile for this one and make it a little bit more of that um, fruit forward flavor. And again, we really want the vineyard and the terroir to stand out um, versus the, the barrel. So this wine was actually made, I'm not the winemaker, um, I'm just a uh, a representative Folded Hills wine lover. <laughs> but the winemaker on this one is Angela Osborne. Um, you might be familiar with her wines. She makes uh, amazing, if you love Grenache, you have to know Angela Osborne. She makes a tribute to Grace wines, which I hope you're a fan of. If you haven't tasted those, get your butt down to uh, Los Alamos and taste those wines. She only makes Grenache and it's amazing. So she's sort of the queen of Grenache, which is why Folded Hills makes Grenache. Um, and Angela's really philosophy of, 
of winemaking in general is, is very connected to the earth and to sustainability practices, not really aligned with uh, Folded Hills philosophy. It's, it's so funny that we are owned by, you know, a member of the Bush family. And I always say we're like the furthest from Budweiser that you could ever be. We're this like, <laughs> like organic, biodynamic <laughs> winery. And um, we actually just got certified organic in our vineyard. So that was really yeah. exciting. And um, Folded Hills, also we grow, you know, we actually grow more um, row crops and acres of organic vegetables than we do um, vineyard. But uh, for now, we might be expanding, but it's, it's really a very cool um, meat region. There's, there's no other vineyards really quite around uh, Folded Hills. And I, I hope there will be someday, but it, it's really kind of a unique climate being that close to the ocean and that um, the hillside vineyard. Is this all estate fruit? This is all estate fruit, yes. So even if it's a, it's a young vineyard, we were able to make, actually in 2017, it started to become all estate fruit, which is really exciting. We are also managed, um, just like Adrian, we're managed by Ruben Solarzano um, and Coastal Vineyard Care, and he actually planted the vineyard as well. Um, it is he didn't get you any of the A-frame trellises? Yeah, we have we have head train grenache. We there you have, go. We have head, so we have a block of head train grenache. Um, but this actually, this block is coming from um, the Ulysses block, and it's called Grant Grenache. So I'll talk a little bit about the name. Actually, kind of funny. Um, there's a connection with Ulysses S. Grant and the family that Andy Bush, our owner, grew up at Grant's Farm in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and Grant's farm is named that way because his great grandfather purchased the land on the still standing cabin on the land from Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> so just some like iconic American history that we don't always experience here in California. <laughs> it's just really kind of neat. So we had to name um, had to name a wine Grant. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, Angela is a great winemaker. Her only problem is she's not a member of the Roan Rangers, and we'll uh, continue to talk about that as we get going here. So, yeah, <laughs> it, um, those of you who know me, know, yeah. Yeah, those of you who know me certainly know that I'm a homer for this organization, and <laughs> you know, it's 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 a shame that there's not more wineries in our region. So, all of you that are out there that are listening, if you're buying wines from beautiful Roan wines from wineries that are not a member, say why. Gotta ask each and every one of them if they are. Join and why not? <laughs> the organization, take part in these wonderful tastings. It would be a great thing. Um, so there was another question that came up from Mark Martinez. The difference in flavor profile between cool climate and warm, hot area Grenache. I mean, from, from my perspective, and I'll let others answer as well, but I tend to find warm climate tends to really push the fruit towards a strawberry flavor more than anything else. Almost like, I mean, there's a strawberry candy quality to uh, probably 80% of Grenache's that are out there because they're grown in warm climates, they're cropped heavily. When you get into cooler climates, I tend to find the flavor profile tends to be darker fruit. So whether it's raspberry, um, sometimes cherry, but to me, that's the biggest difference is that flavor difference. Um, anyone else wanna join in on that? I would tend to agree. I think in addition, some of that spice profile is a little bit more pronounced in the cooler climates as well. Yeah, and, and acidity is acidity is is a difference too between the cooler and warmer client climates. I guess that's not a flavor necessarily, but um, out of the, the cooler climate, uh, yeah, out of the cooler climates, you tend to get higher natural acidity, and and with Grenache in particular, because it has such a, a fruit driven profile, having that that balanced natural acidity is really critical to keeping the wine balanced and keeping it fresh and keeping it focused. So before I talk about my wine, I do want to ask a question. Um, Megan brought up the concept of terroir or sense of place. And that gets asked all the time about varieties. What do you, do you feel that that Grenache kind of shows its sense of place as much more or less than other varieties? And anyone want to jump on that, please go for it. 
I, I vote more. I think it just like, it, it's, I don't think it's as delicate as like Pinot Noir, but. Um, it's not a prissy princess. It's not a prissy Pinot Noir, but like, um, but I do see such a, such a range in Grenache. And uh, especially if we are talking about, you know, the Rhone Valley of, of France, that it's so it's so different than garnacha from Spain or you know Grenache that you're getting here from um, Santa Barbara County that there really really has to be something to that I think <laughs> they're quite different to me. I, I always talk about Grenache being a little bit of a chameleon and really being adaptive to where it's grown and the vintage conditions so I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of transparency with Grenache where it doesn't necessarily hide you know any flaws as well as other varietals maybe um now I guess if you're picking super crazy ripe you know anything's going to taste like anything it's just going to be a big mess of ripe fruit but you know with with a more balanced approach to the winemaking I'm I feel like the Grenache that I've made out of Warner Vineyard the one that we're going to taste tonight you know, it's had a pretty wide range of styles over the years, and it's really ref reflective of the vintage. And, um, you know, it's it, it seems like Grenache kind of tells a story. So for me, uh, I do get a lot of terroir driven qualities out of Grenache. And I mean, I think, you know, Warner Vineyard in particular, the vineyard I've got the most experience with with Grenache, there's a definite terroir to that wine every single year, you know, doesn't matter if it's 13 and a half percent alcohol or 15 and a half percent alcohol. There's some, there's some terroir that shines through for sure. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I don't make Grenaches from many vineyards at this point. Um, we do sort of a tiny bit for blending. You can definitely taste the difference between the sites and growing five varieties on our estate property. You can find the common thread that says, this is Rodeau, this is a state. And it's the, you know, minerality and a tiny bit of salinity that shows up much more easily and noticeably in the white wines, but it is there as a underlying thread in the red wines as well. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree. I think Grenache is, the, on the flip side, Grenache is one of those varieties where I think winemaker intent oftentimes takes over. So you can have a beautiful vineyard like Larner, but if you're picking at 30 bricks, it's, it, as I was saying, it's gonna kind of, it's gonna decimate the qualities that the vineyard site brings to the table. And that does certainly happen with Grenache. Grenache wants to get really ripe. Um, it's a tricky variety to work with. And for all those people that talk about Pinot Noir being, dainty, you know, kind of dainty and, and um, <laughs> fragile, Grenache is so prone to shatter. It is terrible. If it's windy, it is terrible to walk down a row of Grenache and see the, the, what the wind does to it. I know. I was actually going to ask you, Megan, how the wind affects it, because I got to tell you, I can't imagine with the wind you're describing, I don't know that I want to plant a vineyard anywhere near you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, we had in 2020 a much uh, kind of a... a 2020, right? Like I just, uh, kind of a rough year with that. Actually, we, we did lose quite a bit of fruit to shatter that year. Um, so it's similar to the concept of frost. Like it depends on when it comes, right? That if it comes at the right time in the like heat of summer and kind of right now during, we have not had bud break yet. Um, we'll probably see that in, two weeks maybe uh still so I think if it's yeah coming when the when the vine is really at its delicate um point in the growing season that that can be quite uh difficult and we did see that in 2020 but I would say actually gosh knock on like all the wood that uh in 26 in 2017 18 and 19 we actually had not have that problem and it was really um really good yield fantastic well I'll, I'll go into my wine very briefly i promise uh so i'm pouring my 2018 grenache from the spear vineyard this is actually uh, a vineyard that was planted in 2014 so it's not that much older than the folded hills vineyard it's only the the 2018 was their second or third crop to come off there 
Um, it is a 362 clone, a six by three planting on a hillside. So about 2,200 vines per acre. And the clusters are pretty small um, relative to other Grenaches that I've worked with. It is a cooler climate site, so it is definitely challenged to get ripe. Um, I tend not to look at this uh, at all through September. Um, it's just not gonna be ripe in September unless it's an incredibly hot year. Um, I tend to take some different approaches with Grenache. So this Grenache is 100% whole cluster and it definitely shows. Yeah. Um, it definitely has an original <laughs> quality to it. Um, this was aged, in 16, aged for 16 months in five to 10 year old French oak barrels. It was the first year I worked with the fruit. Um, and what I ended up doing was, was bottling three barrels of it. And I still have four that are in barrel because I wanted to see what bottle age versus extended barrel age does. Um, and it's really interesting. And so I'll From probably be, I'll be, be bottling them separately. I mean, obviously I'm bottling them separately, but it'll be an 18. Some of it will go into a blend, but some of it will be barreled separately to kind of show the difference. Um, you know, I think as a winemaker, the one thing that continues to drive me is curiosity. And Grenache is a variety that because it, it expressed itself so differently year to year, it's a really fun variety to work with and to kind of experiment with for sure. So Larry, where about on the property were the, was this block and how did you like the sandy soils with the Grenache? I always like sandy soils with all I my- I do too. I mean, sandy <laughs> soils, I mean, it just, you know, Larner's 100% sand. I work yeah. with Hawk, that's 100% sand. Uh, I work with Vogelzang from Morvedra, that's pretty sandy as well. I just think sandy soils create a challenge for those vines in a really good way. Um, yeah. not, they're not gonna kill the vines, you know, I mean, we talk about stressing the vines, we don't wanna choke them, we just wanna stress them. But I, I tend to find, generally speaking, with the vineyards that I work with that are planted in 100% sand, the grapes come out with more natural acidity, they're riper at lower sugar levels in general, and the crop level tends to be maintained on its own rather than heavy manipulation. Now. This, they did drop 50% of the fruit um, in the 2018 vintage, and they drop a lot of fruit in this block. Even though it's six by three planting, they get a lot of Grenache. Um, and this is block 20, so this is kind of sitting, looking at the, at the road, very, very steep. In fact, I walked, yeah. I walked this, and Ofer, the owner, was watching me, and I, I kind of ran up. He goes, you didn't just walk the entire road, did you? I said, yeah, he goes, what's wrong with you? Um, it's steep, it's very, very steep. You got a sample. <laughs> so it's certified organic. Um, and the, the fruit, I'll tell you, 2018 was a really interesting year. They, they did not have any mold issues whatsoever, which was really challenging for them because it had, they did have some moisture. Um, and being certified organic, they're limited to what they can do. But these clusters were also kind of spaced out. It, they weren't really tight. So it, it was very interesting. Um, 2020 was different working with the vineyard. The clusters were much tighter. But there definitely seems to be I'm getting a signature in this site um, with definitely more, I tend to get more raspberry. I tend to get a floral aspect. I mean, you kind of have to get through the stemminess of this. I know, I know, um, but it's a wine that I, I just, I, I think it stands out in a very good way um, as, be, as being different because of that stem usage, but also because of that site. And it's a site I'm really excited about working with. I also work with Larner. So I didn't want to pour a Larner knowing Matt was going to pour his Larner so I definitely, definitely wanted to pour something different. And uh, I, I think this is, you know, again, I think it's different than all the other three wines, which is kind of the goal here. Yeah, we actually got some Spear Grenache last vintage for the first time. So I'm excited that you brought this wine tonight, Larry, because it's fun to try. I've been out. enjoying tasting everybody's Spear Grenaches as they come online. It's been fun. It's yeah. an oh. I mean, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> site. I know, I mean, and... It's really interesting because just like any vineyard, there's certain producers that they're going to be the last one to pick and yes. there's certain producers <laughs> that are going to be the first one. To, it's very, very predictable um, based on, and uh, you know, there's some names that have been tossed around tonight. Those are the very first and last ones to pick. Um, and their, their wines are going to show very different things, right? That's the, the wonderful thing about Grenache is it's, uh, I like to say that there's about four different styles of uh, overall styles of Grenache. One is the very light, style of Grenache, very food friendly, not as expressive, but very, very light and pretty, not a lot of stuffing. Then you have kind of that strawberry candy Grenache that again, 80% of Grenaches um, tend, to, tend to speak of. And then you have kind of more of a full bodied, broad shouldered Grenache 
And then you have the Grenache, which doesn't seem like Grenache at all. It's more like Syrah. And there's a lot of that out there, just picked really ripe. Except it's just kind of, it's kind of fun to, to explore all those different types. But before we get into Matt, speaking of Grenache and speaking of the different types, I'd love to hear from each of you kind of what your benchmark Grenache is. What, what was either the wine or the style that whether you're producing that or not, whether you're pouring that or not, what is that style that really entices you about this variety? And, I, and I'll and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll start. How's that, Adrian? Um, okay. For, for me, I know this was coming, but I still don't have an answer. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, for me, <laughs> I've been fortunate to have Reyes and Pignon a couple of times. I've been fortunate to have some tremendous old world Chateauneufs. There's something magical about the variety. It, it is a dichotomy of, of beauty and, and structure, but the structure is not like Syrah structure. It's not like cab structure. It's quieter, but it still builds as that wine opens up more and more. So I, I, I don't know, there's something very magical about the variety. Those people that kind of geek out on Pinot, I geek out the exact same way in Grenache. See, that's not an answer. And that's the same thing I would say. I don't think it's one, Grenache that's a benchmark for me necessarily. But if you ask, you know, if you ask me what my favorite wine is, I hem and haw and say, oh, it depends on what I'm eating, who I'm with, the music, my mood, the weather. It depends on 10,000 things as to what I'm going to tell you my favorite wine is. But if you ask anyone in the tasting room or you ask my husband, the answer is Grenache. Yeah. And I think it's because of that same, if I go wine tasting and there's a Grenache, nine times out of 10, I'm buying a Grenache. Just, I love how expressive it is, how it's different depending on the vineyard and the winemaker and the vintage, you know, all these things we've been talking about very much. I just love that about Grenache. There's so much variety and it is, it's the geeking out about it. You know, people geek out over the Pinots and the clones and the this and that, and you know, it's, uh, it's Pinot, but for me, it's like Grenache needs to get that same notoriety that Pinot has because it's all of those things and more and a bag of chips, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and you could eat it with anything. like exactly. Well, and that's what I tell people. It's the wine that pairs with everything. <laughs> food if you don't know what someone's making you for dinner and you're taking a bottle of wine, take Grenache. Yes, I just saw that somebody asked in the comments like favorite food oh. things and local dishes with your wine. And I everything to answer <laughs> that to this question, Larry, too. Like I love Grenache because yes, it's just so like a little bit foolproof food pairing in in a way that um I mean I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend your like super like tomatillo enchiladas with it maybe but like I don't know I didn't I depends didn't, on the Grenache yes I don't like <laughs> I I really I love um Rhone varietals in general because yeah you're not handcuffed as much like the Bordeaux varietals to like this goes with steak and ribs and <laughs> jerky and I don't know that I um really tend to uh, I guess I will say Folded Hills has sort of opened my eyes a little bit more to the lighter side of of wines and that uh your your reserve wine in the collection doesn't have to be your heaviest handed wine I think it should be your best wine and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like all the new oak or all of the you know the ripe Syrah in it that I think that your, your your benchmark or your reserve or whatever you want to call it should be your most finessed wine and I think Grenache tends to bring the finesse really that as as does Pinot Noir I love Pinot Noir Adrian I'm on the same page it's like easier to ask me what wines I don't like than what wines I do like because I just love wine so much. <laughs> um, and I, it's hard for me to meet wines I, that I absolutely hate. Um, so really if it's a well-made Grenache, um, especially, I mean, yes, Chateauneuf to Pop, so great, but you have to age those so long. So I just love our like California Grenache actually. <laughs> it's so easy to drink. This is a 2018 
you don't need to age these really they're ready for the table they're ready for for food i'm gonna go with reyes larry i'm right there with you <laughs> reyes i've also had the reyes well the, the, i guess i guess i was asking like you know again i i think with grenache like as you probably know i'm, I'm active on wine bulletin boards and it's always interesting when somebody puts as a benchmark some big heavy-handed Grenache that to me doesn't really speak of the variety, right? And it always kind of blows me away. And that's kind of why that was the, the basis of the question is kind of like what, you know, what is it about Grenache that makes it special? And yes, all different styles can certainly go, but there, there's something translucent and transparent with this variety that just makes it so exotic and pretty to me. Um, in terms of food pairings, you know, I, I would say that Grenache in general tends to really love pork, just like Pinot does. Those two seem to run hand in hand. But I think Grenache, um, can, you can go lowbrow. You can go pizza with Grenache and you can go barbecue with Burgers. Grenache. And you would be really happy. And it's not, um, it, they're actually going to pair really well together. You know? We actually did a Moroccan veggie couscous the other night and had some Grenache with it. And it was pretty amazing. But it will go pulled pork and Grenache. It, it's a pretty darn good combination, I must say. Burgers are pretty good too. <laughs> All right. Well, Matt, let's let's uh, let's get into your fantastic 2018 Larner Vineyard Grenache, please. Sure. I'm just going to talk about food for just one second, since now I'm thinking about it. And I think <laughs> I think Grenache can slide into any of those Pinot pairings that you would you would use a Pinot that's a little bit more powerful. So I've done, I've done like duck confit with Grenache and it's just smoking, um, salmon and Grenache. Mm -hmm. If the Grenache is a little bit more elegant, you know, more like Pinot Noir. Uh, you know, there's a one liner that I heard on Grenache like a decade ago that, that still kind of makes me laugh. Grenache delivers on everything Pinot promises. Ooh. And, oh, yes. and I think, <laughs> I think that holds true, you know, for a lot of styles. I mean, Grenache can be a super heavy handed, you know, big monster. Um, but that's typically not, not what's produced here in Santa Barbara County and not what, not what these wineries, this group of wineries tonight are producing. Um, but anyhow, I mean, this, this 28, we're, we're trying the Samsara 2018 Larner Vineyard Grenache tonight. And it's probably the wine that we make the least of at Samsara, so it's not a huge part of our program, but it is a, a wine that we've got a lot of history with, um, both, both with the Samsara brand and with me personally. Um, this vintage of Grenache, the 2018, was my 10th vintage making wine out of the same two little rows out at Larner Vineyard. Um, so it's a special wine for me, and, and it's it's cool because I've made this wine, you know, kind of a lot now. I don't, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a year older. So all the, all the time is like really hitting me hard, but, uh, <laughs> but I've made this wine for like, you know, it's my, my 16th year making wine at Warner Vineyard or something this year. So it's a vineyard that's really close to my heart. And this is probably the, the wine that's closest to my heart out of everything that I've made um, in my time in Santa Barbara. So and over the years, I mean, it's, there's been a pretty good breadth of style for what's been produced. Uh, you know, a lot of those years I was kind of doing my little side project, Larner Vineyard Grenache out of the back of the truck. Um, and the fun thing about that was that I really could kind of push the limit stylistically for what I wanted. And uh, fortunately here at Samsara, a lot of those kind of style goals and a lot of that philosophy, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is and really, you know, trying to make the wines that we believe in. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive that this wine is 100% whole cluster. Uh, we, we typically do 75% whole cluster on the Larner Grenache, but this was some of the very last fruit that we got in 2018. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I think I've picked that Larner Vineyard Grenache as early as September 11th and as late as November 19th. Um, so depending on the crop level and the vintage, it's been pretty variable, especially, you know, in the last like five or six years where it seems like, you know, there's not really a normal year anymore. There's always some sort of, you know, weather climactic curveball, whether it's 
you know, tropical pressure or crazy heat waves or whatever. Um, but 2018 was a vintage that was a cooler vintage where we had a lot of hang time. And I remember the, the Grenache at Larner, sometimes those last couple picks that are hanging out there in the vineyards, you know, it's, it's kind of early November, um, late October, early November, things just aren't really moving. And it just didn't, the bricks didn't really rise at Larner Vineyard for like a week or two. And I remember this well, because my brother got married in 2018 and I was on the fence of whether or not to pick the Grenache before the wedding or five days later. And the bricks hadn't moved in like two weeks. And Michael Larner was like, oh, it's not gonna move. It's just hanging right there. Mm. <laughs> and of course I get back five days later and it was a little riper than I wanted. But I think that's really the beauty of Grenache is, you know, I, I've got kind of a skew to, we, we try to pick on the early side pretty much for everything. And with Grenache in particular, it's kind of become like a, like a little personal challenge to, you know, how early can I get away with picking it? And I've had some success there, but oftentimes you think you're picking it pretty early and it's a little bit riper than you, you think it is. So, you know, the beauty of Grenache is it, in, in my experience with, with Warner Vineyard, at least, it performs well at, you know, click, click, click. It can be elegant and 23 bricks and light and racy and just really be a super interesting complex wine. Or you can let it hang a little longer like this 2018 where it's a little bit more, a little bit more Grenache-like, if, if I can say that. Uh, but it's a little more full bodied and a little more classic. Um, and, you know, it's still really balanced to, to me. It's really balanced and elegant and together. And even though it's, it's got the fruit turned up a notch or two, um, it, it still retains that elegance and that balance. So, uh, it, it's a varietal that I, I truly love. And the Larner Vineyard, uh, is a, is a special site to grow it at. And uh, I, I wish that we could get more than those two little rows, but um, I'm happy with what we get. And uh, yeah, it's always a special wine for me. I've been waiting for someone to free up their little rows so that I could get some. So, you know. <laughs> and I think, I think my rows might sit very close to your rows, actually. So, but my rows have trees in them. So I, you know, I'm impacted by the, by the yeah. oak trees, which is never a good thing. And the only thing I wish with Larner is that I wish it produced more fruit. So that's the only yeah. bonus for Grenache is that the last couple of years the the production has not been uh, not been what it is. But I know it's a little it's a little funny there how it it you know Grenache wants to crop high. Oh, sorry, I, I it's I guess it's my birthday and people just keep blowing me up. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but Grenache wants to crop high, but sometimes it doesn't. And at Larner Vineyard especially through the drought years where the vines were just so stressed, um, the crop's been pretty low, but as, as is often the case, you get really good stuff with those low yielding, those yield, low yielding vintages. And a lot of the challenges that Grenache presents viticulturally are kind of mitigated by those lower yielding vintages. And we were talking about shatter earlier where the, the wind will blow off the flowers during pollination and and lower the yield that way because those flowers don't self-pollinate and become grapes. Um, sometimes a little bit of shatter with Grenache is a good thing because it can crop so heavy. If you get the right amount of shatter, it like kind of does your fruit thinning work for you. Um, but you know, trying to dial that in is a little, a little impossible because the wind's going to do what it wants to do. Is that like, is that like getting a little bit of bread? <coughs> is that the same kind of thing? You just want a little bit, but you don't, you know. Not, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't I do think there's a possibility any, of just a little bit if we're talking bread. I do not want any bread. Uh, <laughs> and this no, is- No, we- Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. No, no, I, fire, fire away. Oh, I was just gonna say, and this is the 362 clone, right? Because they you have- know, I, I, they have I, clones. I told you that once and it is not correct. It's the 136. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, so but good, good memory that I-, I told you the wrong information uh at some point in the past <laughs> so the one the, um, one the 136 are actually they're they're large they're more like a topless a clone they're a larger larger clustered clone than 362 they, right i think they traditionally are but at that block in larner it's just been such a a low yielding 
you know, it's the fruit looks good and the vines look balanced, but the canopy is a little shorter. The crops a little lighter. The clusters aren't those big monsters like you normally see. So I, I think in, in that, in that little piece of the vineyard, it's just, it's, pro it's probably, you know, why I like this wine so much is that for whatever reason, the vines are stressed to the point to where they're not putting out, you know, a mega crop and the fruit that you get is really, it's really consistent. It's, you know, full of flavor um, and, you know, good concentration and good balance and all that. Yeah. A little, a little lighter color than the 362 there brings usually it you're you're right because i used to work with 362 uh at jaffers and that was always dark 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 um so it is a little bit lighter yeah it's beautiful i i, I think it's absolutely dropped yeah. in gorgeous thanks yeah no i thank you I, I wish we had more of it i think we only did two barrels in 2018 um you know it's all neutral oak uh oh. Four, Never four, racked, four, just four racked barrels. for bottling. Four barrels. Four barrels. Four barrels. Four barrels. <laughs> unless, unless somebody missed miss did the label. It's four barrels. Uh, yeah, it could have been. Um, I, I, I don't know how you get four two barrels. Two rows, though. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta wonder about the math on that one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it might have been nineteen that had the the even lower crop. So I, I I'll check my notes and get back to you. This is so um, this is so lovely, Matt. I think this also speaks to I I actually love your story about <laughs> the wedding and like it going over a little bit what you wanted to, but that to me is such like the beauty of Mother Nature and wine. And I'll get a little bit like sappy here, but that I know we tout a lot of psalms nowadays, like tout low alcohol wines, but this really, really brings the flavor. <laughs> like there's so much flavor in this. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit riper, like, but it's not dark. Obviously it's really, really light. It's beautiful color, uh, beautiful weight. I think again, like really food friendly and that higher alcohol, I think actually just adds to it. Yeah. Well, th thanks Megan. I, I think that Grenache out of all the varietals that I work with in Santa Barbara County. To me, Grenache has the most flex with ripeness and alcohol in yeah. terms of producing a balanced wine because Grenache does want to be a little riper by nature. You know, it's a Southern Rhone varietal and those Chateauneuf de Pops, I, I actually got a little burned out on Chateauneuf de Pop because for me, um, thanks Robert Park. Uh, but, but I have found that, you know, even those ripe vintages, like I, I bought a bunch of 07 Chateauneuf and then, and then, you know, jumped on kind of the, the, the IPOB train and, and preferred balanced wines and those, you know, big Chateauneuf to pops were a little too much for me. So I stuck them in the cellar and I've been revisiting those. And, you know, 10 years later, it's remarkable how those big higher alcohol wines can age so well yeah. and age so gracefully and turn into like you know I've always said that Grenache you know my favorite older wines to drink when I was at Jaffers were our older Grenaches you know some of those like late 90s uh, Stoltman Vineyard Grenaches and they turned into these like super delicate really pretty floral just you know ethereal wines and so I, I think Grenache it's great because it, it delivers instant gratification, like right right out of the gate. It's just yummy and tasty and juicy and and super good. But they turn into really cool wines and they age so well too because of that great balance of acidity and structure. You know, you don't think of Grenache having a lot of structure, but it does have some some tannin in there. And I think you know that that great balance, that great natural balance that Grenache can achieve you know, make some really interesting wines to lay down and, and check in on, you know, five or 10 years later. Well, the, the tannin thing is a pretty interesting thing because I, I find that Grenache has probably more bitter and tannic skins than almost any other variety I work with. And I know for me, my picking decision is all, almost always based on skin. It's not based on anything else. And I, I'll never forget, I was walking a vineyard once and everyone had picked their Grenache except for me. Everyone had picked their Syrah except for Andrew Murray. And I gave him a call and I'm like, what do they know that we don't know? Or what, what are we doing wrong? And I went and tasted the Grenache and physiologically, it just wasn't ready. This, the skins were, were nasty green and, and bitter. The seeds were still green. 
It was sticking to the pulp. So the sugar raced way ahead of the physiolog physiological ripeness. And that can happen with Grenache. You know, Grenache needs a little bit of patience. And if you pick it early, again, I don't think it really expresses the beauty. Like this Larner is, is gorgeous. If you had picked this two weeks earlier, you probably are not gonna get the aromatic intensity that you're gonna get in this wine. And it, it is really funny that, that what Megan brought up that this is a 14.8% alcohol wine. This is not a high alcohol wine. <laughs> Grenache can handle that to an extent. <laughs> I mean, it does have the stuffing. You know, I think you can find Grenaches that go a lot higher than that. And they definitely get fumy as almost any wine would. But as Matt was saying, I think Grenache does have that kind of bandwidth where it, it can handle more heat and really still produce a really aromatically beautiful wine that can still be quite balanced with texture and with acid, et cetera. It's truly a great grape to be able to do all those things. And more. It is. Yeah. And more. All right, well, listen, we have to end this by wishing you a very happy birthday. Oh, oh, thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me on my birthday. I appreciate it. Happy and birthday. drinking Grenache yes. on my birthday. <laughs> thank you for hanging Thanks. out with us on your birthday. So listen, thank you all who joined us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we'll be coming back next month with Rosés. And then we'll be going back. And every month we'll be doing something else. So please keep following us. Keep, keep following the Roan Rangers as a whole. The national organization does a monthly tasting as well. So thank you to my panelists. I really do appreciate it. And everyone have a great night. Cheers. 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 Thank everyone. you all. Thanks for the happy birthday wishes. Happy birthday, Matt. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs>